Okay, uh, we're going to get started again and try to stay on schedule. The uh, commissioner has a has a busy day, and we'd like to uh, have meeting hygiene to honor his uh, his presence here. So we've uh, we've talked this morning about uh, risk assessment tools and about predictive policing, and and one of the things that has come up in both of those situations is the impact of implementing technology, the real world impact on our agencies of criminal justice of implementing technology. Um, I think we've been fortunate in Philadelphia, uh, in particular with law enforcement, to have a, a, a law enforcement uh, community that is interested in embracing new technologies, but also one that has been candid about the challenges of doing that and the real world implications and requirements of doing that thoughtfully, uh, thoroughly, and, and carefully. Um, and so in that context, we really wanted to uh, have and were absolutely thrilled when uh, Philadelphia Police Commissioner Richard Ross agreed to come talk to us about uh, his initiatives dealing with technology and criminal justice and the real world implications and, and challenges of implementing some of those things. Uh, Commissioner Ross is the leader of the fourth largest police department in the United States. It's uh, almost over 7,000 people, 6,300 sworn members, and 800 civilian members. So it's a massive uh, organization. Um, and he comes to it from a career uh, of achievement within the police department, having spent 25 years with the department, uh, the last 10 as either the deputy commissioner or the last eight as the first deputy commissioner. Um, through a, and has come up really through the ranks in patrol, special operations, the detective bureau, homicide, and internal affairs. So I really don't think there's anybody more qualified to talk about the impact of technology and criminal justice, having lived through every role that one can imagine, both from a, a sort of can-do role and a, and a supervision and management role. And we're absolutely delighted to have him here uh, after a very successful tenure with, um, uh, oh my goodness, I'm forgetting your, pre your predecessor's name. Commissioner, Commissioner, see, see what happens with Commissioner Ramsey. Uh, I think the entire city breathed a huge sigh of relief when Commissioner Ross was named as his uh, successor, and we couldn't be happier to have him. Please join me in welcoming Commissioner Richard Ross. So, good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad you're getting a chance to eat because I didn't want to stand before you at lunch and me. So, so I'm going to spend just a few moments talking about what John already referred to is, is our advances in technology and our challenges. Uh, but I will just tell you as a prelude that I, I probably won't speak very long. I'm interested in hearing if you have any questions at the end, so feel very free to, to do that when I'm done. Uh, but like many departments across the nation, we, we have embraced technology. Uh, but we, the good news is we're doing that now. We're doing it wholeheartedly, but we were a little slow to, to coming to that place, if you will. Uh, 27 years ago, when I joined this job, and, and it wasn't because other technology didn't exist, we, every phone in the police department was still a rotary phone. And uh, so you had stuff like that, it was, the computers were old, and nothing in the department was looking like anything technologically savvy. And so for us to have come as far as we have today, it's even remarkable to me. You all have heard of ComStat, undoubtedly. Uh, where we use geocoding to map just about every crime that we have that is reported. And that is so significant, obviously, because it helps us as a management tool. It serves as a guide for us to see where emerging crime trends are, are happening. And we are able also, in terms of accountability, to hold our commanders uh, responsible for everything that happens under their charge. Because the unique thing about a city like Philadelphia and its size, we have 21 police districts. And our commanders pretty much have uh, responsibility over areas, ge ge geography as well as manpower, that is very similar to medium to small cities. So they have some very significant responsibilities. But in order to get this done, uh, this, this business we call public safety, we have to rely on their ability to get things done expeditiously. And this thing called ComStat really relies on that, is that you get real-time information, you respond to it uh, as quickly as you possibly can, but it's only as good as the technology that supports it. And so ComStat has been a staple for us for at least 20 years, as well as most departments across the nation. And we are very, very happy with that because it really, it serves to not only help you track crime, but you believe it or not, it also helps you to see who you're emerging uh, superstars are within the department because sometimes in a department this size 
with this many commanders, it's very difficult to, to determine who's who, other than in the venues we call ComStat. They can get sometimes a little uncomfortable for people, but we, we don't really subscribe to the notion of beating our people up. We use the technology. We're always looking to advance it. Every year we look to add something to our mapping system which will improve upon it. We don't believe in resting on our laurels. We track everything from the activity that the police officers perform on the street as well as being able to pull up uh, just photos, Google map photos of an area when a commander wants to explain something that goes beyond the words to be able to show, well, let me show you, commissioner or deputy, this is this place that was burglarized, and then they can pull that up in real time, and everybody can look at that. One of the other things that we, we make wholesale use of that came online under my predecessor, and I know I was not really okay with you forgetting his name, he, that's because he is my mentor, uh, Charles Ramsey, but um, as long as you didn't forget my name, buddy, it was all good. <laughs> but um, people have done that. But Real Time Crime Center is, is a mechanism that we use to do a variety of things. I mean, we're very happy with it. Uh, basically, it's a hub of information where a myriad of resources gets funneled into it, many databases. They're able to call from these databases information, use tips or, or get tips from them in real time. Obviously, we can connect to almost 2,000 cameras throughout the city, many of which are not necessarily the city's cameras, but we can tap into SEPTA's cameras and many, many across the city. And we are able to do this and, and really make widespread use of a tool that helps us be very, very quick in our response to emerging trends in real-time crimes as they speak or as they happen. We also are able to use it in a way with something called deconfliction in, in law enforcement, and, and it pretty much stands for what it is, is so that there are no conflicts with other agencies or even internally. So let me give you an example. Suppose for the sake of argument, homicide is looking for Rich Ross at 6041 Mockingbird Lane. And it so happens that narcotics also has a warrant for that same house. Well, for deconfliction purposes, they put this information in and the real-time crime center can be called to see if there's any information at 6041 Mockingbird Lane so that those two entities don't make the mistake of either getting in each other's way or the worst possible scenario, hitting those houses at the same time and putting even other law enforcement people in jeopardy. So these are some of the things that are used. We also use uh, the automatic license plate readers so that we can determine whether a vehicle is stolen or whether it was used in a crime and that the cameras can pick this off, send that information back to the real-time crime center, and we're then able to see what's happening. Let me give you a real-life example of how this real-time crime center was able to help us just two or three days into my tenure as police commissioner. So many of you have heard that a, one of our heroes who fortunately is with us, Jesse Hartnett, was ambushed not far from here, a couple miles from here, but out and certainly out in this police district as he was on patrol. And we get that call in the middle of the night, as unfortunately we do uh, as deputies and chiefs and commanders, when one of our officers are, are harmed. And so we got a call that, that night that an officer was actually shot. And, and as with many things, the information initially was not correct. We were told that he was shot in his leg. And we get to the hospital, and, and the best thing you can possibly see is he's awake and talking. Uh, clearly, the first thing that I asked him is, is, are you okay? And he said, well, I can't really feel my left arm. At that time, we don't know the gravity of this situation, the scope of it. We can't begin to comprehend because he doesn't even know himself that there was a camera, as you all probably know by now, that captured that incident, which went basically worldwide. And because of the real-time crime center, they knew instantly that there was likely cameras in the area. They were able to capture those uh, images. And then on our phones, they sent us just the still photos. But even in the still photos, you were able to see from that how this individual, the offender, had approached Jesse Hartnett just in, in, in frame by frame and that he was eventually inside that car. And so in essence, it really ramp that whole situation up a notch. Not that getting shot is not bad enough as it is, because of course it is. And, and the way he performed was nothing less than heroic. But when you see that video, as many of you have seen, which we would not have seen that night, and would not have known exactly what this individual did, coupled with the confession, the video confession, more technology that was given the next morning or that night, 
it, it helped to, to frame this whole narrative for us of what this was about. And so these are things that we are able to do in the real-time crime center that really, really help us work quickly and be responsive as much as we possibly can to help to stave off criminality, hopefully, which is number one. But if not able to do that, then an, an ability to basically respond and, and apprehend people responsible. We have uh, a program, and you, many of you have heard of programs or, or things like Shot Spotter. We, we're able to detect uh, gunshots. Well, we're, we're using a program that is not Shot Spotter right now, but it's a similar uh, idea where it is a camera mounted on top of uh, a camera, I mean, a uh, gunshot detection camera mounted on top of it, so that what happens if a, the frequency of a gunshot goes off, the camera instantly pivots to that location. So that clearly, one, we can see whether there was actually a shooting, which is important to us. We get multiple calls over the course of a year. Uh, we actually have so many real unfortunate gunshot victims in this city, and it is very sad, that to the degree that we can identify situations where uh, something was called into 911, in this case, it's even before that, they're able to pivot that camera. The camera pivots. Real-time crime center is able to look at that and make some determination as to whether or not this is an actual gun or shooting or a gunshot victim out there, or whether or not the officers need to be careful because they're not able to determine exactly what's going on in this situation. So clearly, it's advantageous for an officer to respond to a situation and already know that there's a gunshot victim there, or it appears that there's nothing out there and that we can slow our troops down and that they're not harmed. This is significant. We are piloting this in basically all across the city, but we have about 18 to 20 cameras right now. We're seeing how this is going to work because it's the camera in conjunction with the gun top shot detection uh, mechanism that's kind of new. And it works a little different than the old programs, but it's something that is really good for us. We really believe it's going to be helpful in, in not only identifying people, because unfortunately there are also instances when people are shot in the middle of the night, no one finds them, and that camera may help us in that instance because we don't want anybody bleeding out uh, unnecessarily. Uh, the big one, and not any bigger, but body-worn cameras. It is the wave of the future in law enforcement. We are piloting the program in the 22nd District. We have been doing so for probably at least a year. Uh, this is something that most departments are going to. The challenge for us is that, well, let me hold off on the challenge. The good thing is the officers here in the 22nd District that have piloted the program are optimistic about its use, and they seem to like the notion. Clearly, in the beginning, there were some issues that we had to get past. Uh, I will tell you an unfortunate uh, thing that did happen. There were about 30 officers initially that piloted this program voluntarily. Uh, there was a small incident involving two officers who were volunteers. And as a result, Internal Affairs had to kind of smack them on the wrist for something that wasn't a big deal, but they got frustrated because they figured, I'm a volunteer, why am I putting myself through this? Then you had the domino effect, and the other 28 did not want to be bothered. And this was problematic because we're trying to kick this program off. So at the time, I was the first deputy. I went down with several commanders, and uh, we just had a dialogue with all 28 or 30 for about 90 minutes. Now, first of all, you might imagine that for police officers to talk to a first deputy for 90 minutes, it suggests right away they're more interested than not. Because normally, police officers dealing with someone of that rank don't have a whole lot to say. It doesn't matter what the subject matter, they just want you to leave their presence. But in this instance, they talk for a long time. And two of the individuals who really set the whole cascading effect of individuals not wanting to be bothered anymore uh, were Officer Stevenson and, unfortunately, uh, Sergeant Robert Wilson, who was killed in the line of duty not more than a week and a half after this. And so... They did not, they, those two actually, actually did not have the program, were not a part of the program when this hurt occurred. And, but it was, it was just a sad moment for all of us. But moving forward, the officers got back into the program. They, they still are optimistic about it. We, we have purchased 300 cameras for the rest of that district. And we believe uh, we're going to go citywide. Now here's the challenges. Most people may think that it's the cost of the camera. It is not. It's the cost of the storage. 
And so when the officer goes out, he turns on that camera, you folks are all in the legal profession, so you know we have to let you know. And if it is something that is of evidentiary value, we may keep it indefinite. If not, obviously we have an obligation not to keep your image if we just happen to capture you. And we kind of keep it in running in tandem with what we do in police radio, which is about 30 days for the tapes. The storage is something that most departments have not figured out yet in terms of it being cost prohibitive. We do not know at this point how we're going to be able to pay for it, particularly as we go uh, widespread in our department, and you're talking at least about 4,000 people who work the street. And that obviously is our aim. We want to be able to, to arm all these people with this because the officers who wear them are saying that they believe it helps them as much as it helps the public. Obviously, it's a great tool for police community relations, Whatever happened, the encounter gets actually taped. Everybody gets an opportunity to see that. The officers also believe that in some instances it lowers the temperature of encounters because people know they're being taped as well. And so all that's a great thing. But it only works to the degree that we can find funding for it. And this is really uncharted territory for all of us. We do not know how much this will cost. I mean, I think one of the largest departments that has gone, at least attempted to go wholesale with it is Houston. And so the jury's still out on that. But I will tell you, we, we absolutely have a commitment in this city to move forward. We just will absolutely have to find funding in order to do this. And obviously, every jurisdiction's policies are different. And so it is even difficult to look at best practices sometimes because it's not just as easy as saying what happens in L.A. or what happens in Chicago or what happens in Houston because then you've got to navigate all the different laws and the policies of those jurisdictions and decide how you're going to proceed. So for us, this is the wave of the future. We do not know. We know that uh, when we store this stuff, more than likely with the program that we have, uh, it's going to go up in the cloud, right? I don't even know what that is. Does anybody know where we can find it? All right, so, but that, that's where it's going to go uh, because the information is so enormous that you got to put it somewhere. And it's just going to be a daunting task trying to figure it out. But again, we are absolutely committed to it. Um, our infrastructure is one of the challenges, and not just related to body cameras, related to just about anything. I mean, we're talking about 20-year-old systems across the city. And I'm not just talking about the police department. It's the city. And, and so whenever we go to bring something online, it becomes a significant challenge for us because the city has not got the infrastructure typically to support the things we're trying to do. And, and it's, I say we, in this instance, I'm only talking about the police department. We could be talking about any city agency. How, how we go about improving upon that, that is way above my pay grade and my technological savviness, so we, we will have to figure that out. And this is why I brought some people here in case you have any real technical questions that won't take a lot to be beyond my purview. But just to say, underscore the fact that this will be a little bit difficult for us, even some of the things we're presently doing become a challenge. I mean, I'll give you an example, and, and I know Mr. Radowski was in the room, and, and we, a couple years back, we started to automate something that should have been automated years ago, which is our pedestrian stops or stop and frisk form, whatever you want to call it. And we call it a 7548A. It just happens to be the police nomenclature. Well, you would think that automating it would make life easy for everyone, right? And so, particularly the police officer. But what happened initially is we created a form which pretty much mirrored that 48A, and it was supposed to be on the mobile data terminal, which is in the car. And it should have taken an officer, you know, 10 minutes to fill that out. And even the most skillful officers were saying initially that it was taking them way too much time. They had to populate it in, in, in ways that was unnecessary. And then, as in true Philadelphia fashion, not only did they have to do that, they would have to turn in the hard copy and someone else would have to try to decipher their handwriting to put it in the computer inside, and which meant an additional person was being taken off the street to do something that automation should have helped. 
And so it's just bizarre, some of the things. Now, we've since improved upon that, but it just speaks volumes to how the infrastructure can cause more problems. In this instance, we created more issues for ourselves than not, than before we even had the program. And so in these instances, what we have to do is work very closely with the folks who really know a lot about this stuff so that we can improve upon our systems. Because it's only you can have the best ideas that you want. You can even try to mirror the best practices across the nation, if you will. But none of that will take place if your, your infrastructure won't support it. And so I know it's something that this administration is committed to. I know it's something that the last administration attempted. And it, it is still a struggle for just about every department across the country. But I will say that despite all that, we have come so far in the last probably decade even in this city, in this department, in terms of what we're able to do with technology, how we're able to leverage it and make our jobs a lot easier. And I'll tell you something, even down to our police officers on the street using their own creativity and innovativeness, they'll use their own smartphones when they get a robbery, they'll grab the complainant, and without even going to the detectives, they already start the business of trying to track the phones. And they've been very, very successful at doing that. We, we absolutely applaud that kind of creativity. I mean, they're young people who came up in a generation who understand this stuff far better than I ever did. And, but, but they're able to use this and they want more. And this is why it's so critical for us to give them more. Because they want to be able to show you and showcase what they can do if they just have the tools at their fingers. And so I'm now going to stop talking and ask if anyone has any questions whatsoever. If someone asks a super technical one, I got my staff over here and they'll be able to help me with that. But if anybody has a question whatsoever about anything that we do, all the way in the back. to me as soon as I walk out the door. I know that, but... Um, <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not the only one who forgot the name. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I won't tell him next week when I see him. <laughs> but, um, and, and, and for the life of me, so how about I just answer your question instead of trying to pull that name, which will come around, you know, when you get over 50, it, it might come around a little bit slower than it used to. But the bottom line is, is as I understand it, at least in the uh, beginning technology, and Kevin, you can jump in here, Shot Spider worked off of triangulization, right? Yes, and this does not, right? And so this is a little bit different. So it's, it's you can stand up if you want. Yeah. It's a little bit different in which it's integrated with the camera itself. So when it actually triangulates the location or approximate location of where that shot came from, then the camera immediately pans to that location. Instead of, uh, so typically the cameras are on a tour, where they just sort of zoom around and they move. In this case, it triangulates immediately to that location, and that points it on that. And it's, so far, it's been fairly successful with that test. And again, it's in 18 locations across the city. Um, I can't really, at this point, speak to that many success stories. But it, it's, it's something that we think will help us. Again, it, I wish I didn't have to speak about the number of uh, gun-related incidents across this city and even the need to have technology like that, but we absolutely need it. We get calls uh, sometimes where people thought they heard a gunshot, officers are raced there, there's not a gunshot. Sadly, you have neighborhoods where they're so accustomed to hearing gunshots, the opposite will occur as well. They'll hear the gunshot, they won't call, there's a person that's lying there bleeding, and you can almost tell from your experience over time, if you get a notification and we get these roaming secure alert networks on our phones it just hits your email about every incident in the city right mm -hmm. and so if I get one for a Saturday morning eight nine o'clock for a homicide victim I almost know that didn't just happen in the street I almost know mo in most instances because a lot of the guys out there doing that kind of stuff are not up yet and, and so I'm not saying that it never happens but what, what I automatically think if they find a body in between a car 
or something like that. It's at that time of a Saturday, Sunday morning, maybe even a Monday morning. I assume that it's because it's someone who got shot three or four hours earlier and no one detected that individual. And sometimes having this technology, if that camera were able to pan instantly to that location where that gunshot uh, was detected, maybe you're able to see, one, somebody walk, running away, which is optimal as well, but two, that person doesn't lie there forever. Uh, do you mind if I follow that up? Sure. Um, one of the one of the sales points for shots. Century, for century. I knew it would come to me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Century. Yeah, you can applaud. Century. <laughs> Just joking. Thank you very much. For that. <laughs> um, one of the sales uh, the sales points for Shot Spotter is in fact that um, that it doesn't record audio. Uh, that it, that it's a type of microphone that is only sensitive to to gunshot detection um, and there's some questions about whether or not that's that that sales uh, pitch is, is actually accurate but but I wonder why um, that wasn't a concern for the Philadelphia Police Department and why actually having a, uh, a the ability to to record that incident was was integral to your decision or if it was it, now you but when you said that are you speaking about record audible sounds other than the gunshot or just record in a, in a visually record? When you well, move. maybe I misunderstand what, what you actually get from this system. You, you can get a visual on, on what occurred. There's no audio connected to it? No. So as I understand it, the, the camera, no, it's no audio. The camera pans. So you're getting a video and it pans to give you a video depiction of what's going on, not an audio one. So, and I, and I think from what I was told, and I don't know if there's a complete nexus to this whole thing, is that they had to be very, very, very uh, acutely aware of how to make that sound only detect a gunshot or something like that. And if you had it pick up anything other than that, now you're going to totally make the, the system uh, confused. And so they, 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 they operate on frequencies apparently that sound very much like a, they're supposed to be very good at it, where it doesn't sound even that much like a backfire. So they're able to discern that. But I think if you were trying to pick up something audible other than that, it would be a problem. But the video, we can pan and we can grab it right there. I don't know if that's, I'm being clear, but. No, that helps. And since nobody else is standing up, I can see. Oh. <laughs> so uh, thanks so much for coming and spending some time uh, with us, Commissioner. I'm curious if there are any particular technologies that haven't yet been piloted or experimented with in the department that looking forward you're excited about the possibilities of how it might enhance uh, policing here in Philadelphia and conversely are there any technologies that other police chiefs or other departments are talking about that you're perhaps somewhat skeptical of? So that's a good question and, and Whenever you go to a conference, there's always a bunch of vendors that are trying to hawk you a bunch of stuff and sell you stuff. In fact, I, I was a little bit naive recently. I went, I had been to major city chiefs multiple times with Commissioner Ramsey, and so normally I was around him, and obviously, you know, people would flock around him. And so when I went to my first one by myself in Texas, I was, I'm always an early riser, I get up and work out, and so I'm always the first one along with a couple guys in the cafeteria area where they have their breakout. And I was multiple tables, and you know, I was like, God, these guys are nice, they're all coming to sit down with me. And I, it's like, God, and I didn't catch it, and then it finally dawned on me, they all were vendors. <laughs> and so idiot me, I was like, man, they're so, so, just nice guys, you know? <laughs> but instantly, Commissioner, can we tell you that it's always stuff out there, here's the reality. Much of the stuff that I hear about, it goes in one ear and out the other for two reasons. One, some of it is just stuff we just can't begin to think about using right now. Um, others are things that we just don't have the money. I hear things from some of these vendors that sounds fantastic, but I know it is no way that we would have the money. So I, you're almost sitting there, you're not listening to them. Um, Kev, I don't know if there's anything out there that stands out for you that you, you think we would want. Be cautious that I don't mention anything that I'd like to propose to you, so I don't uh, <laughs> volunteer you for anything. But um, I think um, if you don't mind me mentioning something that's not, not a uh, specific technology, but I think what's more interesting, the most exciting to me, is how the decisions and focusing on the decisions that can be made with the technology. I mean, we can talk about the technology, we can talk about all this exciting stuff that we can bring, 
But at the end of the day, where the rubber hits the road, is the decisions that are made in the field with that technology. So um, I know with a lot of the stuff that we're looking at now, that's where our primary focus is. Because I can bring the technology, predict the policing, whatever it happens to be, but at the end of the day, if it doesn't make a new decision that bring, makes dots go away, crime go away, then ultimately, um, what use really is it? So uh, I don't know if that really answers your question, but uh, maybe change the focus. I mean, basically, you saying it's only as good as what we have. That's, that's, that's the bottom line. And, and that is true. And uh, I mean, even when we had programs, rudimentary programs that would show crime spike and, and spike detector, as I think what they were calling it for captains, and way back when, even when I was a captain in the 14th district, you know, if, if you don't look at it, <laughs> you know, even though it was only showing you trends that if you were on top of your crime, you probably should already know. But if you didn't look at it in, in with a fresh set of eyes and you just let that program just keep going, well, the program, even though it wasn't, you know, that scientific back then, and I think the same individual has, you know, moved uh, leaps and bounds in, in what he did, but it's only as good as the individual using it. And sometimes that's more of a challenge than you might think, you know, particularly in some large organizations and people get set in their ways. Um, Commissioner, uh Two years ago, we had uh, Captain Healy here, and he'll be speaking later on, but we had him here to talk about the implementation of uh, video cameras in interrogation rooms. And right. one of the things that he said that was very memorable to me was, you can have the, you know, the best policy in the world, but until you've convinced the 6,300 sworn officers that Absolutely. they need to adopt this, it's going to be a real challenge. And so with the body cams in particular, um, there, there are a couple of concerns that, that if I were a police officer, I would, I would have it. I'm interested in how the, the, the department has responded to them. The first one is I, I notice that every time I'm watching the Phillies, um, they'll have an instant replay. And then they've got 74 cameras, and they're all high res, and they're all circled there. And I still disagree with the outcome that happens like 25% of the time. So my, my first question is how you deal with e e this concern that the community's belief that these cameras are going to film everything and solve all problems, and then what you actually see versus the expectations uh, of the community, whether those are kind of in line as you as you roll out the pilot. And the second is something that I really struggle with because I feel like the, the both issues are, are pretty reasonable, which is the question of whether you allow officers to review footage prior to making a statement about what happened in a, in a civilian exchange. Um, and, and I think on the one hand, if I were the, the officers, I would very much want that because the adrenaline's pumping, there's all sorts of things going on, and ultimately what's on camera is what's on camera. On the other hand, the community question about wanting to make sure that they're getting sort of the truth and the officer's perspective and that there isn't anything being hidden, I'm, I'm sympathetic to. So I think it's a really sure. tough issue, and I, I wonder if you could comment on so, that. So to the first question, um, I think there's always going to be um, a challenge to manage the expectations of your community. Lawyers in the room, you know that, you know, CSI stuff, even beyond cameras, people have an expectation in court about crimes being solved almost exclusively through some scientific method, which in many instances is not necessarily the case, and we all know that. So that's a challenge. I think what we have to do is keep our communities uh, as informed as possible about what these cameras are, what they're designed to do, how they're going to help both them and the police officer um, I always hate using the word transparency, but for lack of a better one, uh, will create as close of an environment where people feel that I can see what police officers are doing on an encounter. They're able to recount by virtue of uh, video imaging what, have ha what happened in an instance that may both exonerate and or the opposite with an officer. But I think you, you have to work very hard and be very intentional about how you manage the public. And I don't think you'll ever reach a point where everybody will understand it. I mean, that sports analogy is a perfect one. You know, what's the foot, we're two feet in, where they're not, and so forth and so on. And, and that's going to be a challenge. But making sure people know that it will never be a panacea. You have to just understand what we're trying to do and we're trying to help everybody involved. With regard to, I mean, the second question, with our policy presently, so Commissioner Ramsey had instituted this where it was his belief that an officer, let's say for a police involved shooting, he should be allowed or she should be allowed to view their video only. Can't view yours, even if you were there. The logic being, you were there, you saw what you saw when you saw it. So reviewing it, you aren't getting the benefit necessarily 
of looking at something that you wouldn't have otherwise seen, and this is why you're not allowed to look at someone else's video. There are clearly departments that in this region that don't share that view. They believe that, you know, once it happened, you upload it, you make your report, and whatever's on the video is on the video, and you don't get an opportunity to do that. Uh, Commissioner Ramsey's view was, and, and I actually share it, is that it's, it shouldn't be an I got you. Because the officer doesn't have the, the, the opportunity to change anything on that video. They, they have no opportunity to do that. The only thing that they can do is tag it for a particular incident, particularly one like a police shooting. And then they can't do any more uh, changing, editing, or anything. And so with that in mind, that logic is let them have an opportunity to see it. But again, this goes to the point part about this uncharted territory for us all because there are many, many agencies that have something different. And nobody at this point knows what's right and what's wrong. And so it's just, there's no easy answer. It may come a time in the future when, through all the conferences that we have, just like you folks do, where we come to a general meeting of the minds and say, no, nah, maybe you should or maybe you shouldn't. Much like you're not supposed to shoot at you. It's very, you'd be hard pressed to find a jurisdiction, particularly a major one, that allows a police officer to shoot at a moving car. Doesn't mean we don't. It just means that you'd be hard pressed to find it. So years ago, that was not the case. So I just say that to say that there's room for all this to kind of grow and, and all of us to figure out how we want to do this. But this is where we are right now. Anybody else? I've got one. Um, so I don't know if you're aware, but tomorrow's keynote speaker uh, is a technologist who studies uh, mass surveillance technologies and has spoken a lot among other things about stingrays, which as I understand them are devices that mimic cell towers and can collect data from cell phones within a pretty significant radius. So I thought while well, we had you today, I would ask you if the Philadelphia Police Department uses these, and if so, how? No, I've never heard of that. So and we, I think we would be in a lot of trouble if we did. Um, we don't even use things like drones and, and anything like that because it just right now would just get us in a lot of trouble. Um, I can't speak to whether your federal government does, I mean, but we, <laughs> we don't. <laughs> so my question's around the data that's collected through these third-party vendor technologies that police departments use, and specifically ShotSpotter, when they contract with the local government, retains ownership of the data that's collected when they're deployed in a particular city. And then if someone wants to use it, they have to purchase it, whether they're a journalist or a researcher. So I'm wondering from the public servant's side, do you think that there's an obligation to sign contracts with companies that will make that data public? Or is it OK that what is public safety data is retained behind a paywall? Here's Fran Healy to answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lawyer. information that's contained in a lot of this stuff is evidentiary for the most part. So the issue of whether or not you're allowing a general contractor that's collecting it, they're collecting it on our behalf. So a lot of this information, whatever release protocols we would have under right to know, those would be the same protocols that I believe our vendor should apply to. So if we have a, a basis or a reason to exclude the information on Pennsylvania right to know, then we would actually implore our contractor to, to use that as well. So we're not going to give out something to the contractor that we would not otherwise give out ourselves. So there should be consistency, but we're paying for that for that retention of that information. So it really falls under the purviews of, of our policies and procedures. So is, is there a policy or procedure regarding um, ownership of that data? Does the police department even most, most of the data we're collecting actually, isn't actually stored by our third party vendor. We as the Philadelphia Police Department maintain a digital evidence management system. We've created our own. Basically, if you're familiar with them, uh, evidence.com. Uh, we're basically creating our own internally. So body camera video, um, a lot of our, all our other videos that are being collected are being stored on our own servers. So and those are all FOIAable. Pardon me? Are those accessible through open uh, information requests? Um, you can request, but if it's part of an investigation, it would be denied. I mean, we, we go by the guide, guidelines of the right to know. So if it meets the guidelines and can be released, we release it. If not, we, we don't. But we go strictly by the guidelines. And every department in the city actually has a right to know officer. So every request is funneled to that officer, and they work hand in hand with the law department to determine whether or not we can or we should not give out the information. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. My question.
question is on the uh, use of the Federal Best Bureau of Best Investigation Biometric Database that went national in 2014. Is Philadelphia using that? I'm sorry, what was the database? The FBI Biometric Database. Is the city of Philadelphia using that? Are you aware of that? No. I'm, I'm not even aware of that, but you, you pose a question that we're going to go back and check on because if we are, it's a problem. <laughs> that, that's the, so it's the, the FBI's biometric database. database. Hmm. No, sorry. It might be something that uh, Mr. Garvey knows. Yeah, maybe, maybe he knows. I, I, I would go out on a limb and say we're probably not, but it's something we should look into. So thank you for raising that. Uh, my question is about predictive policing uh, systems. I know there are several several vendors you work with. One, uh, wondering how you assess how you assess uh, your choices there, and whether to use a private vendor or whether to build something in house and um, use some of the open source technology. So, uh, just last year, uh, working with Azadia, uh, and actually Dr. Taylor, we took part in a. Uh, a study funded by the National Institute of Justice uh, that Temple University received uh, using the Hunch Lab software. Uh, in this case, what we were doing was testing policing strategies using predictive software. We did a full randomized, full randomized control trial with that. And we did three months of property crime and three months of violent crime, testing basically <coughs> using a patrol car as a deterrent in areas that were predicted, using an unmarked car to sort of Use it, but sort of catching the act, and then also it's just an awareness. So I just distribute that roll call. These are your high risk areas. So um, uh, Dr. Taylor is uh, working on those stats right now. So we haven't received back the results from that test. But uh, I think really the only way to evaluate something like that is through, uh, you know, uh, something like the randomized control trial. And the way <coughs> doing something like that within patrol is difficult when we have the kind of sort of dwindling resources that we have. So luckily with the former commissioner and the deputy commissioner, uh, they were willing to devote the, the patrol resources to test that out. But ultimately, that's really the only way to evaluate systems like those is, is to see what the end result would be from some, something like a trial of that nature. Does that answer your question? Yeah, can you say anything about your plans with that sort of technology going forward? Well, I think, um, I'm not trying to fund it, I swear, but I think we really do want to see what the results of that uh, evaluation will be. Um, I think that um, ultimately, hopefully, that will maybe guide us towards the next step. I know <coughs> since we started with, uh, with Azadia, I think Azadia themselves have been involved with other sort of more open source type predictive models. And predictive policing isn't just predicting, of course, locations of crime, but it could also be a number of other forecast models. So it's a pretty wide area. Uh, I think we're going to see what we get from this study and then at that point evaluate and go from there. Thanks. Um, just real quickly, uh, hopefully I don't ostracize myself. I used to be a prosecutor for 15 years, so um, <laughs> you never know who's in, who's in the meeting room. But um, I, I, I truly enjoy my relationship with law enforcement officers, but my question is with technology predictive policing and all these things, do you have? Do you find yourself having issues with the DA's office in explaining why you're moving to a technology or where they, they, can't, they can't understand how to use that technology that you're using to better your police forces? Is that a point of a, a large amount of conflict or is that something that you, that's easy to get through? Yeah, I, I don't think so. Um, obviously, when you, when you drill down you know, in that relationship, it, it's, it's always been a good one, but sometimes you, you, men and women get frustrated when they don't get a case pushed where they want to. I think in, in the instance of some of the technology that we would work alongside with them, it would be more the opposite. And I'll give you an example. E even before we had the video uh, confession capability that we do now, we, we were somewhat rudimentary in our homicide unit where what they would do is they would, act, and I know because I was there twice, uh, they, they would actually take the confession and then go back, and if the guy gave you a confession, then they videotape a synopsis, a summary of the confession, which was really, really archaic even for the times when I was in homicides, which was in the early 2000s, because there had been departments that were using essentially what we're doing now for years. And so I say what I'm ultimately saying is the DA's office obviously wanted far more video confessions, you know. And so that was at a time when there was tremendous resistance uh, in the department. Uh, and, and it was only used when you had that slam dunk case. And, and so if you don't use it 
uh, all the time. You bring into question why not and, and what is the issue. And even though the DA's office wasn't making that argument, their argument is we would love more confessions because it makes the job easier, particularly in instances when people were suggesting they were coerced. And you can see from start to finish, as we do now, that you're not. I'll tell you, and I'll just kind of run with your question just a little bit if you give me some latitude. Um, right now, it, it, it was a little bit of some growing pains, uh, particularly in our homicide unit initially. I think it's kind of separating, you know, the men from the boys and the girls from the ladies, if you will, in, in that some of these stellar detectives who are really, really adept at getting confessions are the ones who are proving that. And in some instances, some may struggle a little bit more. And so the reality of it is, is this here to stay? And this is what we're going to continue. So, um, I understand, of course, that there's lots of other databases in the city that could be of use to criminal justice. AOC has data, prosecutors, probation and parole. What efforts are underway to integrate those data systems across the whole city, including the police data? Well, Kev, do you know if, if, if <laughs> so, uh, I can guarantee you this is going to be an infrastructure thing, but I'm going to let him talk. <laughs> so, so we, uh, so probably over at least 10 years, the department has been slowly gathering uh, and aggregating data sources, not only internally on our multiple internal systems, but also uh, state systems like probation, parole, and others. In fact, that was one that uh, it started as simple as just someone that was emailing an Excel file and then pulling that into the system and then uh, tying that into the rest of the rest of the databases. But that's been done mostly as an internal effort and uh, with, a, with a pretty limited staff to be able to do so. Um, but uh, I would say that um, I was just in, uh, in the parking lot after Tom set today talking to one of our, a couple of our captains about some other external data sources that they were looking to integrate into it. So I mean, it's a, it's a constantly evolving effort to do so. Some are more challenging than others. Um, we have to deal with security firewalls and, and, and of that nature. But uh, when we can, we do. Does that imply there will be some kind of common ID that will, for example, match people across these different data sets? Well, so the, the state already has uh, an ID system as do the feds and as does, does Philadelphia for um, um, identifying folks and being able to tie them together. Obviously, there's probably multiple Kevin Thomases with the same birthday that end up. We do see that often, and that's always a challenge. So um, we do have to use um, some statistical software sometimes just to try to match people to those IDs to some level of confidence. That can be tricky. Uh, but uh, primarily, that's we, we just build off of those existing ID systems, identification systems. Thank you. Um, you mentioned a little bit earlier the considerable expense that goes into um, retaining body camera uh, footage. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the process that you went through to decide on a vendor for that body camera footage? It was reported back in March that you went with a, there was a sole source uh, contract with Taser International that was signed. I wanted you could, wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you made the decision to uh, contract with Taser for that. Uh, expenditure. So I'll start out and then I'll let either one of these guys chime in, but I, I believe we started with about seven cameras or more. Yeah, and, and so we, we gave a lot of latitude to the officers who were piloting the program. There were, I think they said there were a handful of them never even made it out the door. They just didn't feel comfortable with them. They were either cumbersome, they just didn't feel the, like the way they felt. And so they ended up going out with about three, I think that they were looking at very seriously. And at the end of the day, even though, you know, you had one situation where I think it was Taser's camera or audio or t the, the visual wasn't as good, but ultimately the whole package was better. And, and that's ended up be being what was the case because it, it, it became, the, the differences was very nominal between one or the two cameras that they narrowed it down to. And we, we wanted to leave it to a lot of the officer's discretion in the beginning because we, we needed that buy-in. And so if we jammed a certain camera down there, their throats and they didn't feel like it was functional, well then that's counterproductive for a lot of reasons. But once they drilled down and we realized the, the nominal difference between uh, two cameras and the taser was one, I don't remember what the other one was. Yeah, and, and so we, we elected to go with that and uh, as far as the other sole source thing, I mean for us it's, it's still a pilot and uh, so, and, and when they, they ended up buying essentially the other company. <laughs> Good. 
just a, we also partnered with Temple University again uh, with uh, Dr. Liz Groff and uh, Dr. Jen Wood on uh, that evaluation as well. So they came in, they took part, and they helped uh, structure the surveys. They worked directly with the 22nd District officers to be able to help evaluate which system they were use. So, uh, I'm sorry, they brought in a bunch of different cameras from these different vendors That's and right. they tested them out in that district. That's right. And then those officers chose the one camera that they liked. That, that's essentially what happened. Obviously, we, we looked at a lot of things uh, relative to cost and everything else and, and feasibility about storage and, and things like that. But the essence of it is is it started with multiple cameras, was drilled down, uh, multiple ones, well, not multiple, there were a handful that never left the door because they just weren't going to be functional. But the officers had a lot of say over the cameras that we were going to select when they got it down to one or two. And then we had to make evaluations based from there on cost, what we're going to do going forward based on storage, whether or not we're going to be able to afford that storage, whether or not they were providing something in the beginning because it was a pilot that wasn't going to be cost prohibitive. So there were a lot of factors that went into place. So what, what is important to underscore is because we're still in a pilot program, we technically still have not selected a camera that we will be using wholesale. I mean, it is only in the 22nd district right now. And so we will select another district. And once we finally get to that phase, that's when we will make the determination as to what camera and when we put it out to, because we'll have to put it out to bid. And, but then you get into the challenges of, well, who has the technology? Who's going to deal with what your, your, your issues are in Philadelphia? Talking about a lot of people, 4,000 people, if we ever get to that point. It is so enormous, some of the challenges that we'll have to contend with. But we'll have to deal with that one step at a time. I mean, we chose the 22nd district, one, because it's very busy, and two, although not in geography, in terms of manpower, it's the largest one we have. So figuring that if we could make it work there, we probably had a strong likelihood we could push it out to the city. But keeping in mind, even with the purchase of the additional cameras, which would amount to about 300 cameras, we still are ways away from outfitting every one of those, those people because the training we got to make sure everybody's trained in not only how they use it, how they download it, when they're supposed to be able to turn the camera on, what the policies are. So in essence, even our policy is, is a pilot policy because that's where we are in, in this whole project. Do you know when you expect to you know, take that to the next step, when this is going to transform from a pilot project to something uh, that's as, more significant? As soon as, one, we get the 22nd district and up full scale, and that's operational, and then quite bluntly, I mean, when we find the money, I mean, because I think we had money for, was it 800 a year or something like that? And so, but even that, I mean, you're talking about trying to figure out how to phase all those cameras in, making sure you don't do them all at one time, because you're talking about technology, technology breaks. And so if you were to, even in an optimal way, pick 4,000 cameras at one time, four years, they're all going to break. Or the, the, it's just like, you know, if you buy a new house, I know what happened to me. Ten years later, every appliance pretty much broke at the same time. And so, I mean, the same, now you're trying to outfit 4,000 cameras at once as opposed to saying on a cycle, we'll, we'll rotate in. So is, there is no science to this for any department across this country. Obviously, it's a lot easier if you're talking about the departments that represent most of the 18,000 in the nation, which are very small. That, that's a little easier to deal with. But when you're talking about the fourth largest department in the country, it is a lot of things that go into this and a lot of things that you need to vet before you just go out there and now you can't come back. Thank you. Uh, hello. I was wondering if you could tell me your efforts to bring the public along to work in, that, in the 22nd district. Um, to work with them in terms of making them aware of what's going on and receive their input. Okay, to bring the public along with the program? All right, so that's a good question. And, and so we are still going to try to figure that out as well. Um, we have, I'm just curious, how many people here are from Philadelphia? Show of hands. Okay. Is, does everybody here know what a PSA is? Police service area? My point exactly. So, so we, we've had this, and I'm going somewhere with your question. We, we've had this police service area program, which is designed to subdivide every district in one, two, or three PSAs, police service areas, that where a lieutenant 
would head it so that the captain who has such significant responsibility would be able to drill down and that lieutenant, those three lieutenants or four lieutenants would have geographic responsibility for a particular area. Where I'm driving at is that we have to utilize these kind of programs in order to push that stuff out. We have a number of community meetings, as many of you know, but the best way to do that, in my estimation, is not just through the paper or social media or news. Obviously, we would do all that, but also for a dialogue kind of like this with a PSA lieutenant or even the captain, if not, you can't do it with a PSA lieutenant, to explain even some of the particular questions that people will have, just as you have. Because you're not going to be able to cover all this stuff in the media in some little sound bite. And people, you've raised some very good questions about even body-worn cameras. And so you've got to use a venue or form like that, in my estimation, to push it out. So that is our plan to do that. But first, we've got to get people to know what PSAs are. And we haven't done a very good job of that in eight years, even though the program started eight years ago. And it's something that could be a really, really significant tool for us. And, and I ask the question because it just demonstrates to me how poor of a job we've done at marketing it. Because when I ask that, everybody should know not only what a PSA is, but if you live in Philadelphia, what your PSA is and who the lieutenant is. And so clearly we've got a lot of work to do. Fran and Kevin, you see that? I mean, live and in color, uh, we got a lot of work to do. But thank you, ma'am. That's how we'll, one of the ways we'll do that, that I think will be most fruitful. So in our last panel and in your remarks, uh, I think you've highlighted one good example of how the academic community can partner with the police department, mentioning the work you've done with folks at Temple and trying to evaluate the predictive policing technologies that you're uh, trying to introduce. I was wondering if there are other examples or thoughts that you would have on ways that the academic or research community can be helpful to the police department in terms of meeting the challenges it faces with respect to technology evaluation or adoption? Well, I don't really have a particular one because I think it's something that is, is going to be ongoing. Um, we, we've done programs with uh, universities. I hate to keep saying Temple because I'm at Penn, but um, with Footbeat program and, and that we need uh, the folks in academia to help prove what we believe. It's nice if we say, whether it be a program, whether it be technology, it doesn't matter what it is, or just crime evaluation. If, if we're the only ones suggesting that it's effective, well, one, is okay that no everyone else is skeptical, because it's you saying it. But if you get a disinterested party who says, no, we evaluated that, we used the right trials, uh, we, we used the right random whatever they do, and, and then, you know, whatever that is, you know. And, and so, I mean, you, the, the only problem with some of that stuff, and let me, now I'm about to go off on a tangent, that the only problem with some of these things that we do, we're forced to do like these, uh, what do you call it, random sampling? Randomized control trials. Randomized control trials, that's a lot. And so it ends up, for the law enforcement person, it's a challenge because we're relegated in many instances to saying, leave that area alone and we'll use something similar. And to law enforcement people, and not just me, but now me trying to sell that to the captain that owns that area, it's hard. <laughs> it's like, you want me to do what? You want me, for the sake of a, an experiment, to, because it's hard to, it's, it's, it's so easy to get myopic and to say, yeah, but I got crime right now. And you're gonna call me before this tribunal called Comstat, and then you're gonna ask me, in an aggregate way, why my crime is up. And are you going to remember, Commissioner, number one, that you asked for this uh, trial or this uh, experiment? And two, what am I supposed to say to the police officers and the residents where we don't target and focus like we would normally do in an issue? So it is, it is something, it's one of those things that's you know, hard to get your brain around, and, but it's real. It's real. So we will continue to do it. We, we've had success with it. Um, it's just you've got to be judicious in how much you use it, but it is extremely effective uh, because it's just nice to be able to do it when we did the footbeat program or predictive policing. It's nice with our footbeat program when instead of just guessing or hypothesizing about the fact that we believe footbeats in targeted areas, um, small enough, people to patrol are going to be not only effective in reducing crime, but in improving police community relations. 
And when you're able to say that a university was able to determine that there was a 22% decrease in violent crime, now not only is it good for your program and you believe what you believe is now proven, but you can push it out to your comrades across the nation, which is what we did. But you got to be careful about how you do it and how much. But we will always do it, but you just got to temper when you do it and how you do it. Uh, so, Commissioner, I want to be sensitive to your time. Do you have time for two more questions? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi. My question concerns uh, roadside um, drug testing kits. I was wondering if you use them, and I was wondering if you had any problems with them, because other states have had problems, specifically in Texas and in Florida, where the rate of pa false positives is, uh, is, is uh, pretty prevalent. And um, that, if you do use them, might be an interesting way to use an academic center like Penn, because, of course, there's lots of vendors at different shows promoting the uh, benefits of a lot of these portable kinds of kits and what they purport to do. And uh, scientifically, maybe they could be tested to see what their reliability uh, would be all about. Now, we're not using, but has anybody tried to sell them to us? Are you aware of that? Yeah, we, we, we do not use that. And so, um, and, and I'll be honest with you, I'm not that familiar with the, the science and the technology of it. Uh, and, and no one has even come to us, which I'm surprised about, to, to try to sell that, whether we were interested or not. So that's something we'll, I'm just curious about it, if nothing else, is, is what, how they're being used across the nation. But thank you for that. Thank you, Commissioner. I had a question about how the city and PPD has made a big push in the last decade to get private CCTV cameras uh, sort of networked or at least logged for checking in crimes uh, after the fact. And have you seen that that's had an impact on clearance rates yet for any crimes? Or is it still just sort of on a case-by-case -case basis without sort of larger evidence on its effects? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the city's program, what, what are we, 300 still right around 280 or something like that? And with, with you know, about 93, 4% of them in operable condition. And, and as I said, the con connectivity is really good to the other cameras around the city. And we, we've had a significant level of success using them. Uh, look, I don't, I don't personally believe they're a deterrent. That's just my personal belief. Um, but maybe for certain types of crimes, maybe. Um, but certainly, it, it provides a level of comfort in, in just about any neighborhood you'll go to. People ask for them, they want them. But in terms of solvability, absolutely. You know, we, we are very intentional uh, about searching for cameras immediately. It's one of the first things that we do after a shooting or a robbery. We want to see whether there was a camera in that area. And you, we push that footage out through our media relations department uh, as quickly as we get it. And so, and the media thankfully cooperates with us. So you, you will see a number of crime surveillance videos that may not be ours, but that we have even something we've got from businesses. Um, we've got our safe print cam program where we sign up uh, businesses that have them so that we can know that there's a camera and we will even geocode that so that we'll know that ABC business has a camera and if something happened, I'll, I'll give you an example when right after the Boston bombing, when the Broad Street run was following immediately after that, I mean, we walked down Broad Street, I mean, South Broad Street in, in particular, looking for businesses to sign up, asking them to cooperate with us to have their cameras panned on board. And, and I think just about all of them were cooperative. So it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's not just us in the city and other agencies that have them. It's something that the general public understands and can appreciate. And so we've had a significant level of success with regard to solvability, absolutely. I mean, because some of these guys, thankfully, they're almost posing for these cameras. I mean, they, they don't realize it, but I mean, it's better than a photo album. When you look at some of them, I mean, you look at them, it's like it's not a question who that is. So, I mean, we love that, and uh, we will continue to use that, and, and hopefully we'll get to a point where we'll, we'll get even more. It's, it's the world we live in. You're always on video somewhere, right? We all are, so this is why we're pushing body cameras and everything else, so because it's just the wave of the future, whether we like it or not. Thank you. Well, Commissioner, I want to thank you for your time, your, uh, your candor, and your uh, willingness to take on these topics and uh, educate all of us. Thanks very much for being here. Thank you very much.